George Vanderbilt was one of the richest people to ever walk this planet. And what did he do with all that money? Well, he built a massive mansion. Vanderbilt's mansion was called the Biltmore, and to this day, no one has built a bigger mansion in North America. It took six years to build, and at 175,000 square feet, it was a giant monument to Vanderbilt's interest in literature and art. It has 250 total rooms, including 35 bedrooms, 65 fireplaces, a solarium, all on a sprawling estate of over 120,000 acres. It's not easy to maintain a home this large, and at its peak, the Biltmore employed a staff of 400 people. Wait, is that right? That sounds a little high. Yeah, 400. But it must have all been worth it. Vanderbilt must have loved and treasured such a beautiful home, right? Right? Well, no, here's the crazy thing. Vanderbilt actually spent very little time at the Biltmore. It was too big. It didn't feel like a home, which kind of makes sense. The dining room seats 100 people. I mean, it's kind of weird to eat there by yourself. This staircase is grand, but what if you forget your wallet upstairs? That's a lot of stairs to walk. Vanderbilt himself called the home utterly unaddressed to any arrangement of normal life. And the New York Daily Tribune wrote at the time that the Vanderbilt money was certainly bringing no happiness to its present claimants. And in the end, the house cost Vanderbilt so much to maintain that it nearly bankrupted him. He ended up selling most of the 120,000 acres in order to repay his house debts, and the house became a tourist attraction. No one lives there, even today. Now, I'm not actually at the Biltmore. The Biltmore is in North Carolina. I don't have the budget for that. I'm actually here in Toronto at Casa Loma, the biggest home ever constructed in Canada. It was built by Henry Pallet, and you'll never guess what happened to Henry. He also nearly went bankrupt, and in order to pay off his debts, he had to sell Casa Loma. Massive mansions continue to be built today. I know this because I watch tours of them all the time on YouTube. My favorite channel for this is Enes Yilmazar. He and his team tour everything luxury, from yachts to beautiful penthouses overlooking New York City, and of course, massive mansions in Beverly Hills. I mean, this one is ridiculous. 21 bedrooms, 49 bathrooms, indoor pool, bowling alley, garage, full gym, candy room, a full spa, and a massive theater. I don't know, it's just fun to see these houses. It's kind of fascinating. But I do always wonder, are these homes practical? Like obviously a mansion like this is meant for entertaining and parties, fine. But what about the rest of the time when you're just living your life? Cause this place is huge. Like your whole family could be up here having a great time. And if you're down here, you might not even know. And I always think you're gonna be doing a lot of walking through this place. It's like the size of a hotel. It reminds me of what Vanderbilt called the Biltmore, utterly unaddressed to everyday life. Okay, here's another example. 50 Cent famously bought Mike Tyson's mansion, a massive 55,000 square foot home. It has 21 bedrooms, 39 bathrooms, seven kitchens, and a nightclub. But 50 kind of soured on the mansion. I don't want a big house no more. I experienced that with the, the Tyson mansion. I bought it, it's 55,000 square feet. Well, you bought Mike Tyson's mansion? I didn't know that. Yeah, and then you look down the hallway and you go, whenever you look down the hallway in your house and you don't want to go down there, <laughs> There you go. I don't care what's going on down there. I don't want to go over there. Huh? Like, That's too big of a house. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. I didn't need it. I didn't... On another show, 50 explained that he mostly just hung out in the master bedroom. How do you fill an 18 room house? See, what happens is you, you get a bedroom, you get the master bedroom. Because even though it's, it's your house, you still you have a staff in that type of house. So it's like if you leave the master bedroom, somebody, you, look, you live where you can walk naked. Right. This is the space where you can just do what you want to do there. So once you leave that, that area, you, you'll be seen like by someone. And like, interestingly enough, when 50 was originally buying the house, Mike Tyson, the seller, actually warned him against it. Well, I was trying to explain to him, you really don't want to buy this house, because if I, if I didn't sell it to him, there was no way I knew I was going to sell that house. No one's going to buy it with like 60,000 square feet. It's going to cost, it's going to cost him $25,000 just to mow the lawn. <laughs> right? right. So I'm telling him, like, listen, you don't want to do this. It's not a good idea. I think both 50 and Tyson deserve credit. They bought a massive mansion, but had enough self-honesty to say, hey, this wasn't for me. I want to get back to the Vanderbilts because the story does have kind of a happy ending. 
Now I should say I'm taking a lot of the Vanderbilt story from Morgan Housel. Morgan wrote what's probably my favorite finance book of all time, The Psychology of Money. Anyways, Morgan has this great story about Vanderbilt's descendants gathering at Vanderbilt University in 1973. And guess what? There wasn't a millionaire among them. That's crazy. This was a family who in 1877 controlled one in every $20 in America. They squandered it all in less than a hundred years. And with no more massive inheritances to pass along, a new generation of Vanderbilts was born. You might even know one of them, but I'll let him introduce himself. I'm Anderson Cooper. This is CNN. That's right. Anderson Cooper, famous journalist, CNN anchor, and Vanderbilt descendant, though not an inheritor of a great fortune. And here's what Anderson had to say about the Vanderbilts. You never saw yourself as a Vanderbilt. I know. No, 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 no. Like I, have, I at a very young age, looked at the little I knew about the Vanderbilts and the, what I knew about the Coopers, who were farmers in Mississippi during the Depression, and how they kind of all ended up and how they lived their lives. I was like, I'm going for the Coopers. That's going to be my model. Like, I don't think anything good can come out of the Vanderbilt side. You know, a lot of the Vanderbilt said, it sucked, the money they got, it sucked the initiative they, they might have had. I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Anderson witnessed the Vanderbilt's excess and wealth firsthand and decided it might not be the best thing for him. Instead, he tried to make his own way. And I think that's a happy ending. Thanks for watching.